Children of the night, what music they make. Is the mic on? I think it is. Rick's show on the radio, welcoming everybody to our edition here. March, uh, what's the date here? This is the 12th? Yep. Thursday. Yeah. Uh, we're listening to some Black Bats, good friends of mine. The Black Bats 24. Let's listen to a little bit of this. Hey folks, welcome to the show. Like I said, it's Rick's show on the radio. I've got my guest Charles Dye, writer and uh, producer, director, also sound uh, music producer as well. Uh, Ali Dolan, who actually is the uh, real life in, in, um, influence for this short story that we're going to be talking about called Two Secrets. Right? Yep, that's right. And my good friend over there, Jay Eric, Jay Bird, he's a... Uh, Welcome to the show, Jay. How you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for having me back. Sure, man. Yeah, he's been on it before. Uh, Jay's going to be talking about his uh, participation in our transmedia sensation going on at the Abyss Theater called Theater of Vampires and all some other works that he's doing. So welcome to the show, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Great. So, Charles. Yes. Uh, it seems that uh, before we started the show, that uh, we found out that we have a, a lot of a uh, lot <laughs> a lot of things in common here, and especially that would be a lot of friends. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And uh, history down here in Florida. Yeah, well, I, I've been a part of the the South Florida music scene for a really long time. Um, worked uh, started out working at uh, Criteria, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, and ended up over at uh, Gloria and Emilio Stefan's studio, uh, Crescent Moon, uh -huh. and just been you know. I, I was really actively involved in, in South Florida music, at least through the mid-2000s. Wow, that's great. So yeah. we do have that in common because yeah. I as well have done that since uh, the 70s, uh, playing here and there. And uh, But you're into audio engineering. Yeah. Uh, Did you ever work with job. A, I hate to drop names, but I do like to drop names, especially when they're friends of mine. You know Frank Prinzel? You ever work with him? He oh, was my a God. Guy. Of course I know Frank. Uh, Frank. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Totally. Going to have to get him to listen. Frank, to if you're show. listening, love you, baby. Yeah, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom McWilliams, good friend totally. of ours as well. Absolutely, totally. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Been on great. the road with Tom for many years, and and uh, we were production partners for a good chunk of time there in the late uh, 90s, uh, early 2000s. Working with uh, the Estefans, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. Wow. I'd love to hear some road stories from you guys. Oh, I bet there you are many. some funny oh, ones. Oh, there huh? are many. We literally <laughs> toured the globe. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, when you go on a road with somebody as a musician or whatever, it depends on if you're, you know, the guy who seeks out trouble or you're not seeking out trouble. And 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 Tommy and I and and Frank actually and I probably I don't know, but we're the guys that we're the good guys. We were never trying to get drunk, yeah. you know, yeah. or look for the girls and all that. And we're just watch the other guys do all that. So actually, I think that's why we remember all the stories. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it was fun stuff. Great memories, great memories. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, welcome on to the show. And Thank you. Um, the reason that you're here is that uh, you've segued into the uh, film business as, again, like myself. And uh, you came up with this uh, a really great uh, story idea, uh, which is a true life story that Ali is uh, the inspiration for. Absolutely. And uh, it's called Two Secrets. Yes. And uh, I guess my. Before we get into that too much, and let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, where you're from and, you know, some of your personal history. Where, where are you from, Charles? Uh, Michigan and Ohio. Grew up in Michigan and went to college in Ohio. And yeah. then uh, upon graduation, I came down here, and that's when I got my job at, at Criteria, which later became called Hit Factory, but when I worked there, it was called Criteria. So when you, when you went to school, you were, uh, sound engineering was your deal, right? I Is actually studied... All three things. I studied audio and video production at school. I was I was interested in film from the age of, well, I don't know. 
mm-hmm. two, <laughs> sometime very early on, I was into film. I actually initially wanted to do that. That's mm-hmm. the thing that I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I was the lead in all the high school plays. And, you know, I was into the, the whole, I didn't want to be an actor, but I wanted to make films. Mm-hmm. Um, and my plan was to go to college and study film. But I got sort of sidetracked into music and uh, got all excited about music at, a, at, at like a, a pivotal age, 17. And uh, so yeah. when I went to college, I started studying both. But the internship that I got after college led me to Criteria, and cr- that internship led me to a job offer So at, at Criteria. So yeah, world-class studio, you don't yeah, want to turn that job is. offer down. Especially down uh, when you were going there. I mean, yeah. that was like during the 80s, right? Late 80s, early 90s, yeah. And, and I, it was... It was an exciting time. A lot was happening at Criteria at the time. A lot was happening in the music business. A lot was happening in Miami. Mm-hmm. Really exciting. So I I stayed in the music business for quite a long time. Uh, I, I worked with, you know, a, a number of big artists. Um, kind of a, a peak of my career was uh, I worked on Ricky Martin's English language debut as the recording engineer on that album. And when it came time to mix that album, uh, they were starting to do the mixes in New York you know, a really big name engineer, but my rough mixes became the ones to beat. And oh. in the end on Live in La Vida Loca, they asked me to do a mix and we compared it. Well, we didn't, but they did. Compared it against the mix that was done up in New York and they ended up choosing mine. And then that kind of started things rolling. Yeah. So I ended up mixing about half that record and uh, and uh, and two other singles. Wow. I guess that kind of a situation can really build up a great reputation and that's where you... Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, especially uh, that's a great uh, track, uh, La Vida Loca. I mean, yeah, that's that's yeah. And as it. I like to say, I was just the guy in the room when it got mixed. I mean, that's a great track because it's a great song. Desmond Child, who wrote it along with Robbie Rosa, wrote a great song and they produced a great track. And of course, Ricky delivered it. Uh, and mm-hmm. uh, I just, you know, I just pushed the faders up. But uh, but it, but it was fun. Right. Desmond Child, man, that guy's been around this area for quite a while. Yeah, yeah, he's the the most amazing vocal producer I've ever worked with. Yeah, I, I learned so much from him. He's a and he's a great songwriter as well, but he's an amazing producer. Still working in the area with uh, um, the Desmond's been know, to or? Nashville and Los Angeles. He's done a number of things on the Voice or. Maybe not the voice. Maybe it was the other show, uh, American Idol. I don't recall which. Um, he still comes down from time to time, but uh, I haven't worked with him uh, since about two thousand. Ah, okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, let me see. Uh, how about your transition into filmmaking? Mm-hmm. When? What year did that happen? Last year. Just last year. Last awesome. Year. That's yeah. great. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, f- judging from the look of your film, uh, you have a really good eye, a good professional. Uh, uh, process, uh, purpose on that. It doesn't look like Thanks. it's your first, like, hey, I'm going to put a camera here and try it. You know, it looks like you really thought about it and know what you're doing there. It look, I agree that it looks that way, but I, and this is not false humility. Um, we, we were really fortunate with to have such a strong story. Um, Ali's story is a really compelling story. It's a really inspirational story. Mm-hmm. And so we worked together on writing the script. And once we had a script in a, in a, in a form that we could start sharing it with people, um, it, it really just started happening that n- so many people I would share it with that I kind of would have expected to say, well, you can't make a movie. You've never made a movie before. Nobody actually ever said that. And <laughs> the opposite kept happening. What everybody kept saying was, what can I, they would ask, what can I do to help? Yeah. So um, at a very early stage, uh, we secured um, a person like that who, who, who was in love with the project and wanted to be a part of it named Miriam Ersaz, who is a, a, an experienced f- feature film producer um, out of Boulder, Colorado. And uh, she came on board as our producer and also helped with the script. So uh. in the end, the script is a co-write between her and I and Allie and I writing the story. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then... She essentially secured the crew, uh, not oh, for free. Great. You know, we had to raise money online, uh, like everyone else. Uh, w- uh, we used a fundraiser, which is a similar to Kickstarter site. Right. Um, but once we raised the funds, um, she brought in this, and we shot in Boulder. She brought in this phenomenally uh, talented crew. N- seventeen people on the crew, um, six in the cast, or seven, and. Uh, and, and and the gear, right? Yeah. All yeah. the yeah, equipment. Yeah. All I the saw equipment. some of the pictures of yeah. that. Uh, yeah, the, the red is hers. The red scarlet's hers. Mm-hmm. And uh, and 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 these people are all feature film experienced. Uh, our AD is actually a feature film director, and you know, like he's is running the ship. 
Right, he knows so what he's doing. So really, I just had to know what I felt the actors needed to do. And, right, and right. we worked really closely with the actors, um, Sarah Bartels, who was our casting director, and uh, her. She was like a dialogue uh, and acting coach. She's a very experienced actor, and and she was very helpful in working with the actors. Mm-hmm. But but as long as I knew what needed to happen in a scene, and long as um, our DP and I, Laffrey Whitbread, had previsited it out. Right. Um, we just my bottom line to this really long story is it looks the way it does because of the collaborative efforts of everybody yeah, involved. That's right. It's that, the only way it looks the way it does because everybody, true. I asked everybody to bring their own voice to it. Yeah, that's the way you do it. That's, yeah. that's the, to me, uh, as uh, a person who has directed, yeah. that's the best thing to do is to get the people to own part of the project, not just tell them, I want you to do this or I want you to do that. Of course, you want them to do what your vision is mm-hmm. because i mean it has to be somebody's vision yeah but you need to have other people uh feel like they've owned the project absolutely sure. and 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 i encouraged i mean i had a conversation with every member of the crew at the beginning of the process and i and i encouraged each of them to express themselves in, in their craft whether it was costume or hair or makeup and since hair makeup and costume were all heavily involved in the storyline there was actually a way for them to express themselves mm-hmm. um uh, laffrey of course our, our dp our director of photography did a brilliant job and he brought so much to the film um everybody the lighting it was it it, it looks the way it looks because of all these amazingly talented people who wanted truly wanted to be a part of this project and all of them i mean n- nobody was paid what they were worth yeah, yeah well. none of them. The, everybody came in and really just they they read the script, they loved the story, and they wanted yeah. again wanted to be a part of it. Well, that's great that uh, you know that's an important part of a film is uh, of course the talented people and the good equipment and the people that know how to run it. But of course, it's the story that is the most important thing. And here. I realized one other group of people we were hadn't talked about either the actors, but let's talk about the story. Yeah, we'll talk about the story here, and uh, so. Uh, Allie, yes. This is your story. Yes, sir. And um, how did you guys? How did you find out about Allie's story? Or, or, and well, I actually I grew up in the Northeast, and mm-hmm. uh, and I I came down to to Florida for one of the secrets, which was a girl. I moved to Florida for a girl, uh-huh. and uh, and I started working straight out of college at a post production company called The Kitchen TV, and that's where I, I that. met Charles. Um, so as, as I'm sure you've told people before, it was, it was sort of like an early time we had become friends, mm-hmm. uh, had been working yes. late one night and I decided, uh, that he was a friend enough to sort of bear my soul and, and tell him a little bit about my life. And, uh, we both sort of like looked at each other like, yeah, you know, this could actually be something. Mm. Someday we could actually collaborate and make this something. And, you know, when I was growing up and and living my story, living my life, I always thought it had to be a certain way. You know, you had to write a book and then you would go on the book tour and then maybe somebody would option it for a movie. But I was never interested in the writing. I was interested more in in the collaboration and the talking. And, And that's actually what we did to do the script is he actually interviewed me and I would just, you know, shoot out the things that had occurred and mm-hmm. how I felt about certain things and and that's really how we how we got the script so it was a it was a process that took I mean well over a year just for the script alone yeah. so yeah. Mm. yeah yeah that's uh it is quite a story uh when you think about it and would not to give out a whole lot about the story because not very many people have seen it but we actually will see a good segment of it today here on the show in a little yeah. bit uh, but the fact of uh, being such a young person, you know, uh, I mean, your subject uh, is what is supposed to be. How old in this? Twelve. Like can, twelve. Can I give the one-liner old. of the film? Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's two secrets uh, will change twelve-year-old Janie's life forever. One, she's never told a soul. The other, her entire family's never told her. Mm. Tonight, they're going to crash. Yeah, that sounds good right there. I mean, it's a good log line. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is much. a good log line. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and 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 so that's. It's the story takes place basically over 18 hours. It's a single day overnight and then morning. Yes. So uh, that's great. So just a conversation and opening up your your heart to somebody else has led to uh, the fact that uh, other people will share your story with you on the big screen now, which that's 
that's kind of a cool thing too, isn't it's it? It's amazing. I mean, all, all I really ever wanted out of this was to touch lives. Uh, I think yeah. Charles the same, the same way, to transform people, mm-hmm. to to move them, to to shake them up a little bit, and to realize, you know, that there are things that happen to people, but it doesn't. it's not the be-all, end-all. You know, it doesn't define who you are. And uh, we like, as a society, to put a lot of labels on people and, and keep them in little boxes. And, um, you know, I, I did that to myself for many years, is put myself in a, in a box and tell well, myself that I... Well, when you're that, that I, age... Yeah, uh, of course. <laughs> you know. What's right, what's wrong, you know, mm-hmm. things like that. And uh, my, our film is really just to, to encourage people to be who they are. Hey, that's a great, <laughs> that's a good theme, I think. It yeah, really that is. is the theme. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, Actually, yourself. believe it or not, that's what the Theater of Vampires is about. You guys got to come check it out, too. Yeah. Okay? Oh, yeah. Come see Absolutely. your show, too. Thank you. Yeah, so just that one conversation led to the film. Now, uh, how involved were you during the production part of it? Like, uh, or I know that the writing part, at least you gave him the idea, but, you know, a writing, there's a lot of dialogue. Right. And you go, hey, how did this conversation go with this person? Uh, yeah, I mean, there there are parts when I when I watch the film that are, are so eerily exactly as they happened that oh. uh, it really takes me back. Um, but I really saw myself um, during the filmmaking process as more of a consultant. So my job was essentially done. But when it came to the actors who may have questions um, about their characters, especially the lead, uh, mm-hmm. Janie, you know, if there were questions that they had for me, I wanted to be easily accessible. So I kept myself at a distance. I actually did not go to rehearsals at all because I wanted them to have their time. Right. Um, but when it came time to being on the set, you know, it was, it was exhilarating for me. I loved being there. I mean, I, I walked into, we have a scene in the woods and I was like, is this my backyard? Like it was so perfect, mm. picture perfect. So um, it really took me back. It was, it was a really amazing experience. Amazing. I'm sure it was amazing, but, uh, you know, how did it feel, I mean, to see this young actress portray you and to go through the things that you did back then? It was... um it was very emotional. Um, there were there were days where it was emotional on the the happier end of the spectrum, um, the nostalgic you know mm. end of the spectrum. And then there were there was one scene. Uh, I, I hope that's going to be the one we yeah. maybe show today. Yes. That uh-huh. was the most um, true to life and um, was really the the make it or break it point in my life. Um, mm. And that was the. I mean, I I, I watched the first take and I knew we were going to have to do so many different camera angles and so many different takes. And, uh, you know, our, our casting director looked at me and said, you other room, like you get to watch the first one, but you're going to lose it. And you need to, you know, one time is enough. So very, I had to remove myself. Well, I got removed from the situation (laughs) because it was very emotional. Well, let's talk about what you said there a second ago. You said, um, that that was a make it or break it point in your life and uh i'm i don't know if this is not uh like a giveaway or anything but judging by yourself right now and your accomplishments i'm gonna say it was a make it moment in your life wouldn't you say um gosh i mean great question it is a good it's a really good question think this is not where our film stops this is a short film this is a snippet we are doing a feature um and there are there are a lot of other things that happen beyond the point where our film ends so um sure you got to grow up (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) exactly um so i would say that um it was it was a turning point um i did have some ups afterwards i did have many downs afterwards mm-hmm. and uh you know just like anybody there a couple of years go by and you, you get an idea and you, you go after that one you go after that dream so mm. now you know i'm in a very good place and i have you know very mm. clear goals and dreams and aspirations and i'm going toward them so that's probably what you're uh, picking up on kind of <laughs> yeah i'm i'm thinking you know if i was told the secret that you were told uh you know how i would judge my life's worth Mm -hmm. you know and i you know i don't know if i would do the same thing but uh apparently you did you took the ball and ran with it uh, figurative figuratively and uh, maybe literally because (laughs) (laughs) these days now uh what what are you involved in now i mean i you were telling me that uh you're one of the uh renowned triathlete now is that yes correct? that's correct so yeah I played sports all my life um you'll see in our film that uh when I was 12 I was really into baseball not right. not softball but baseball I played with the boys uh-huh. I was the pitcher they were all scared <laughs> um and you know how's I, your curveball by the way 
I actually didn't throw a curve, but I had a really nasty fastball. Oh, see, nasty. Yeah, and yeah, and changeup, which was the crazy thing, because if I threw that changeup after a fastball, the, you just had no idea what was happening. So That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, so I, I played sports all my life. It was it was always a big part of my life. But actually, <laughs> thinking back to the kitchen where I met Charles, um, he, he was the guy who had oh, decided right. to, to sign up for a triathlon. And I was like... Really? What? Why would she wasn't doing anybody? Trots. I was like, why would anybody want to do that? That sounds like horrible. That sounds just. I mean, I, at that point, I wasn't playing sports. Out of college, I was just hanging out in Miami, having fun. Um, they'd signed up for a triathlon, a couple of coworkers, and I really. The day after they got back to the office, they were totally changed, like as human beings. I mean, honestly, they the really? sense of accomplishment yeah. that they had on their faces yeah. made me want that, yearn for it. So, what, what does a person do if, uh, on a triathlon? A triathlon, triathlon. Yeah, triathlon. So yeah. they they swim, they bike, and they run, and it's all in succession. Um, so you know you. you here so in what's South the problem? Florida. I go in the pool, yeah, I no, swim, no. I ride about, around the block. How about, a, how about an ocean swim? How about an ocean oh. swim with oh, and waves and creatures? So uh, the, the distances that I've been doing mostly are sprint and Olympic. Mm -hmm. So that could be anywhere from a quarter mile to a half mile swim or Ooh. even a mile. Uh, oh, in, the ocean, in the ocean, you know, open water. You open know, water you've got water. hundreds of people around you punching and pulling. and Riking, I mean, it's like everybody waves, for currents. themselves. Um, and then you transition. So you've got like a, a little bit of a run from wherever you exit the water to grab your bike. And then you get on the bike and you could do anywhere from like 12 to 20 miles in, in a time. And then you've got another transition where you load the bike back up, grab your shoes. You got to actually change in most uh, right. situations and then go out for, you know, a three or six mile run. Whoa. So, you know, yeah. you could you, it could be an hour or two of uh, just an you and your two? body. Yeah, just. They, you do all yourself. that in an hour or two? Well, yeah, yeah. The goal <laughs> is to do it. The goal is to do it in the least amount of time. That's the goal. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to yeah, be out three there for or four hours. <laughs> yeah, I take all day. Oh, hour. I've done one of those actually. I've uh, actually this time, th this weekend is the uh, seventy point three Ironman in Puerto Rico, and I did that last year. You did, yeah. And oh, I was out there for almost seven hours. I mean, it oh, was. Wow. Whew. You know, I grew up as a competitive swimmer, and even. In the swimming pool, there are preferred lanes to use oh, to have the least amount of resistance. So if you've never mm. done it in the ocean, you can't even imagine how difficult that must be. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I love to I love to swim in the pool, and and you know you get your stroke down. That's where you really hone in your technique. But when you get thrown out into the open water, it's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. oh, it's yeah. more like survival. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is. So is there any part of that triathlon where you go, I can't wait to get out of this water and get on my bike because it's so much easier on the bike. It's and so like, funny can't because... can't wait to get off this bike. Yes, that's what happens. <laughs> it's it's like when you're in the water, you're thinking about the next thing that you have to do. For me, my favorite is running. So if I can just focus on the one thing that I'm doing, I know that my favorite thing is at the end. So I just mm. have to, you know... So you're a runner? You like running? I love running. Uh, but prior to, to meeting Charles and working you know, with him, I, di I could not run a mile. Honest, honestly, wow. I could not run a mile. I would get on the treadmill and I'd go like two minutes at a time and then <gasps> out of breath. And I mean, I was never, I never thought I was out of shape, but I most definitely was. And now, I mean, I just did my first so marathon. Did I miss something so. here? You said after you met Charles, mm -hmm. that's when you got into the triathlon? Uh -huh. well, right, because I had I had done a try yeah. with myself and a couple of coworkers. Yeah. And when we came, she, we actually invited her to come. She, I was like, no, you no, guys I'm are not crazy. Gonna do that. That. I'm not going to do that. No. So this really? is like, Five or six years ago? Five years ago, yeah. Yeah. So we did the try, and we came back with this post-try glow, which is like right. this, like, you're just like, you just... It, I can you, do anything! Uh, right. Yeah, you feel everybody. like you just conquered the sure. world. So you, 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 you want to just, just, like, you just... Yeah. You can't stop talking about it, and you're just kind of electric. And I was like, "All right, all right, all right, I'll do one. Fine. If you can do it, I can do it, and I yeah. probably can do it faster." Like, that was, you know, that was a big challenge. But I got the bug. I mean, yeah, I, I think actually yeah. the second try, I maybe did be you. Yeah. I don't know. I don't. Oh, we'll look. We'll look at it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember anymore. Well, needless to say, I I, I, I bought didn't. the I bought the uh, got the bug so badly that the day of my triathlon. You know, I, I went home and I showered and I and we ate like our body weight and food. I mean, I yeah. just was eating all day. Um, I took a nap, which was the best nap of my life, by the way. And I'm a champion napper. Um, mm -hmm. But I signed up for another try that same day. And mm -hmm. I have done 20 to date. Whoa. And I, I want to make 20. my career uh, as a triathlete. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. I just, you haven't like... said it. She wants to go to the Olympics in 2020. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Well, wish you the best on that. But it sounds like there's a little 
cross mojination going on yeah. in the inspiration totally. department Absolutely. between you two, huh? <laughs> hey, you want to yeah. be a filmmaker? Let's do it. Yeah. Hey, you want to be a triathlete? Come on. Yeah, absolutely. I'll do it. One, I'll do it if the, the nap part is in there, like you said. There's the <laughs> pat, the nap. Yes. Is that in there? It sounds to me like he's the coach. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, anyway. oh, she's got some pros that do that. Pro napping? No, nope, pro coaching. Pro coaches. Oh. Pro yeah. coaches. <laughs> yeah. So is there another one coming up for you anytime soon? Yeah, actually, um, in April. April 19th is the South Beach Triathlon. And this okay. is uh, notoriously a, a different distance um, because they have a sister triathlon in Malibu. So that they do it a little bit longer than a sprint. Um, this year, I'm hoping to do it under two hours. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big one. It's, it brings, I think, about 5,000 uh, people internationally, wow. too. Wow. So, Allie, do you live down here now in South Florida? Is this your I home? do, yep. I live in Miami. And are you guys looking forward to a release or of your film anytime yeah. soon? I know yeah. it's just, it's in post-production right now. Yeah, right? yeah, we're, we're in post. Uh, we're most likely going to complete in mid-April at this point. We were shooting for the end of March, uh, but uh, now it's looking like mid-April. So, a couple and extra you're going to go to the... Uh, the film festival circuit with it? Yeah, yeah. Our goal is uh, to go to the Oscar, to enter into Oscar eligibility film festivals. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the way that works is uh, for the short film category, if you win in one of these 30, there's only 34 Oscar eligibility film festivals for short films. If you win in the short film category in one of those 34 festivals, in any, you don't have to just only in one, you're on what's called the um, nomination shortlist which is the list that they then choose a committee uh, then chooses uh, the five films that will be the Oscar nominees in that category of best short film. So we felt in the writing stage that this story was a really strong story and that we had a potentially really good script. And um, I shared with, with everybody uh, on the project um, that if, uh, you know, if we could all bring our A-plus game, I feel confident in one thing that at least in the discussions on film blogs we could hopefully be talked about as a possibility <laughs> great we have no idea if we're there yet but uh, and of course we well, will only know leap. after it's happened but 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 our goal is to at least enter there in those festivals and see what happens um any local film festivals you're going to Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Fort wanna, Lauderdale International, maybe? I want to be in at least the Fort Lauderdale, but most likely the, there's... I don't know the names of the festivals down here just yet because I'm so focused in post. Right. Um, but I, there's a festival here in Fort Lauderdale. There's a festival in Miami. So at least West both Palm of Beach. those. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. at, at least those two, maybe three. There's, there is an Oscar eligibility film festival. It's the one in Orlando, the Florida. Yeah. That, that one's Oscar eligibility. Yeah, I like uh, the Fort Lauderdale because, I don't know, it's local and you get to see all your... Bring all your yeah, family and we friends. We would totally want to be in that. Yeah, yeah that absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, it's, especially because we filmed a little bit yeah, down here. Yeah, so. and we shot down here too. We, we didn't shoot everything. Right. Yeah, we shot uh, we shot a day and a half here as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but most of it was shot where? In, uh, in Boulder, Colorado. Okay. And isn't that where actually where things uh, took place? Or, or where did most of your... Or that was in Northeast, right? Yeah, Allie? yeah. It's it's funny because I actually have um, part of my my family is from Boulder, which is or from from Colorado, really. Um, which family are we talking about now? Uh, my adoptive family. Okay. So yeah, so it, it was cool to be able to kind of give a nod, shout out to them. It just so happened that you know our producer Miriam and the crew were out there, but it it made it feel a lot like home too. Um, Boulder and, and rural Pennsylvania where, sure. where all the events actually took place were very, very similar, um, especially in the fall, you know, with the changing leaves and everything like that. So I'm from Philadelphia area myself. There right you the go. Outskirts. I'm Doylestown. So. Doylestown. Oh, my God. How about that? That's where my family's from, too. Yeah, awesome. Doylestown. And <laughs> that's where the story, uh, that's girl, where the story actually, actually, actually the happened. Place in wow. <laughs> there you go. Here's another coincidence. Yeah. How about that? It is very pretty up there. It's gorgeous, yeah. It really is nice. Very nice area. I love that. And, up and there. we didn't have the Boulder double as Doylestown either. No, we shot we shot Colorado for Colorado, or we shot Boulder for Boulder. But right. mm -hmm. but what we didn't, you know, emphasize the mountains. So it doesn't. You can't really tell where we are in the film. Right. Right. Yeah. You just can't tell, and that's that was intentional. We kind of wanted it to feel sort of like Middle America. Yeah, it like could it be run. anywhere, sure. and it could be anywhere anybody. America. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, the way that uh, you were adopted parents were portrayed in the film that they seem to be you know they're very supportive you know they didn't but they just don't want to tell you uh their secret yeah 
Yeah. I mean, that, that's how it was in real life. I mean, my, my yeah. parents were supportive of any, anything I wanted to do. I'd say, you know, I want I want to play the, the drums. OK, here you go. Uh, no, no, I actually I want, I want to play baseball. OK, here you go. And, uh, and anything that I wanted to do, they were really supportive. Um, But I knew growing up, you know, I had friends who were adopted and it was always a discussion, you know, that even even in school when mm. you'd have these assignments, these, you know, go home and find out why you have brown eyes right. and your dad has you know blonde hair why did you get what you got and i would get mm. so like frustrated because i'd say how can you think that everybody here was born into the family that they're growing up with because that wasn't the case for me so um these homework assignments um you know family tree assignments mm -hmm. just really dug down under my skin um so i'll bet you that was uh kind of a, a shaky thing to happen for your parents as well going oh yeah. my god yeah now we're doing this again yeah i mean because i would happen. bring it up all the time what's what's the big deal why can't you just tell me where i came from i mean mm. I, I don't really see what the big deal is here guys and uh and that's mm. when i started to figure out wow if they're not telling me then there's something big but mm. I, i'm gonna find out well i'll tell you what uh, it's getting close to the bottom of the hour and at this point i think i would like to uh play an excerpt from your film here uh, this is actually the first time anybody's going to be seeing it here except for you and in, in a little screen in a studio uh, <laughs> editing over and over again. Right, Charles? Yep, yep. And uh, I, I'd like to, if you don't, if we have the time very sure, briefly, I'd like to have. do a setup on it. But before, prior to that, right. we, we, I spoke glowingly of our crew, okay. but not our cast. Um, we knew that the story was going to be challenging. Um, we knew that our, the cast was going to make or break it. Um, so we spent months... Uh, three to six months casting the film uh, for the six cast members. And um, as unbelievable as this may sound, for our lead actress, we knew that role was going to be highly challenging. We literally looked at 2,000 actors to find her. Wow. Um, and um, and the, the sort of ironic aspect of that is that she's actually the first actress we looked at. Isn't that weird? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, and we just kept going back to her. We we auditioned her, and she, you know she's a young actress, and 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 she did well. But but we just we wanted to make sure we had the right person. So mm -hmm. we went through the entire casting sure. process, and we kept coming back to her. Her name's Cassidy Mack, and uh, she just kept every time upping the ante and kept doing more amazing stuff. She's and we knew this scene that you're about to see, we knew that this was the make or break scene mm. for the film and the casting. So she's the one actress that had the ability to, to do this scene at a level beyond like exponentially higher than anybody else. This intense um, knockdown drag out with mom and dad. And uh, uh, her story is actually similar. She uh, was essentially a band um, adopted and and uh, she was an adopted child and shares sort of some of a parallel life story um, wow. with Allie. So it, it helped her in the portrayal of this character. But all the rest of the cast is brilliant. So right. should we briefly set this up? Yeah, sure. I'd like to mention that. Yes. I just noticed that uh, the way you tell that story and uh, the parallel between the actress mm -hmm. and Allie here is uh, just there's this serendipitous nature of the universe that yeah. comes around and, and kind of just smacks me in the face all the time. Goes, <laughs> yeah. Okay, you want you want yeah. this? Well, here, I'll help you do this by giving you this person. And it, I just really love that when that happens. Yeah. Yeah. And we discovered her by accident. I mean, there's just no way we accident. would have ever... Yeah, we would have never met her. I was watching the news, Brian Williams, one evening, and she was featured for 15 seconds on the Feel Good Story that's at the end of the news, the Make a Difference thing that they do on NBC. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't the feature of the story. She was a blip in the story but i had a dvr and i went back and i went like what and googled and she's a hollywood actress she's from los angeles and uh and then i emailed her and we never heard back from her mm -hmm. and then a few months later or, or maybe it was three weeks four weeks later she said i just found your email in my trash <laughs> really i would <laughs> love to hear more about this story it really sounds like something that i'd like to be a part of and uh, and so that was how we auditioned her, and then as I said, went through all the other actors, and then we came back to. to What's Cassidy. the young lady's name again? Cassidy Mack. She is amazing. Yes, we'll have to watch her because I see some big potential in that young oh, lady. She's going to be big. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Charles, you want to set up the scene here that we're going to see? Okay, so this is immediately after the best and worst night of Janie's life. Mm. Um, she gets to sort of uh, vicariously through her her best friend Mark experience the possibility of kissing 
the girl that she ha is in love with uh, or has a big crush on, who is actually her best friend. Janie is the, our character's name in the film. And she has a crush on her friend Stephanie. And uh, this is a party at Stephanie's house. Uh, but then by accident, she ends up sort of outing herself to her friend and then right. almost confessing. One secret out of the right, way. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. one secret out of the way. And almost confessing her feelings, but then chooses not to. And then through a misunderstanding, believes that Stephanie has just asked her to go kiss her as like a practice kissing session. You know, 12-year-old right. girls practice kissing. Sure. You know, trying to practice how to kiss so that they can kiss boys better. So in misunderstanding this, she follows her down the hallway and walks in on Stephanie and Mark kissing. So... Now, Janie, with her heart crushed, mm. um, comes running out of the party. This is outside Stephanie's house with the sketch in her pocket that Stephanie had given her to say, come to the party tonight and dress up with all this makeup on and look like a girly girl. Mm -hmm. You'll be great at the party. So this is the reaction to that. And then she comes home and uh, in confronts her parents. All right. So let's watch this uh, scene from Two Secrets. <laughs> sweetie what we know is that you're our daughter but I have other friends who were adopted and they they know so much they know where they were born they know what they weighed they have medical history they even have birth certificates why don't I we simply weren't given that, that information. information. Oh my God, you say that all the time. Stop. You say that all the time. And there's something that you're not telling me. Jay. We love you more than life itself. You're a miracle in our lives. I mean, isn't that enough? No, it's not enough. Because you know why? Because you know who you are. And you know who you are. And I am so tired of not knowing who I am. So I want to know, what's the big fucking secret? A newspaper article in front of you and told you that you're you're found in a trash can yeah yeah so I mean I, I knew there was something weird going on um, as soon as I read the headline there were a couple things you know that that went through like man this can't be real that somebody made a mistake 
this seems like the plot of a movie or a soap mm-hmm. opera. I mean, those mm-hmm. are literally the things that went through my head. But then I started thinking, well, no, I mean, that makes sense that they hid this from me because how do you tell anybody this, let alone a 12 year old? Right. You know? So uh, how long did it take for you? forgave them or or came to grips with you well know. i had a i had you know a stint of uh of alcohol and drug abuse after that um i needed to escape my reality um because mm-hmm. the reality was so dark sure um but you know i i i forgive i forgave them for withholding it and i still felt their love you know they didn't love me any less it was right. really they were protecting me so mm-hmm. i was able to to forgive that but i i don't think i was at that age able to forgive myself i kind of put it all on me like there was something wrong with me like i was worthless for for, for some reason why nobody wanted me like as yeah. a baby so it, it took you know there was a lot of as i said ups and downs throughout my adolescence to right. to get me to a point of being like able to see it on on right, uh, sure. a video and so. talk about it on the radio <laughs> yeah. i guess right well i'll tell you what uh, that is a great story that you brought to us here thank and you very much thank you charles i really appreciate uh really looking forward to the uh you know the whole thing here uh, i wish you the best of luck and uh, i'm glad that you came on my show and and ali uh thank you i'm very glad much. to see that uh you know that your film and your story has come to life and and it must be somewhat of a catharsis for you. Absolutely. Uh, and for other people to come out and see it and to know that, uh, you know, nobody, nobody's life is, is worthless. Exactly. And you can do great things. It's just, absolutely. you know, maybe we'll bring you back on the show and you could tell us what it is in your heart that brings you to this point where you are now, where you are so confident. You're such a confident young woman that's, uh, you know, kicking people's ass on the triathlon. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I would love I, to. I can see how it'll be a feature. There's a, there's a lot of story there to tell. So yeah, brilliant yeah. work. I'm, I'm, Thank you. All right, I'm glad to have seen just a, even even a Thanks. clip of it. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Well, actually, I'm going to take a, just a little bit of a break here, and we're going to come back and we're going to talk to Jay Bird here and talk a little bit about Theater of Vampires, if you guys don't mind. Absolutely. Awesome. Charles Dye, right. thank you very much, thank you very and much. you stay right you. here. And okay. And okay. Absolutely. Allie? Yeah. Ali Dolan, Rick. nice to meet you. And we're going to take a little break on SoFloRadio.com. By the Glass. By the Glass is a show about beverage culture. Brad Hubbard. What I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the dots on how everything works together. It's really all about how we enjoy things, how we enjoy life, and how beverages play a big part in that. I'm going to bring in people that are going to display their aspect of the culture. I'm going to bring in people that are going to show you different products. We're going to look at places where people go to consume these beverages and how they all interact. Things are built around the actual beverage itself. By the Glass. Thursdays from 6 to 7. Only on SoFlo Radio. Hi, Sandra. Hi. I heard you had a new karaoke gig. I do have a new karaoke gig. It's at a wonderful location, Seabreeze Bar and Grill in Davie. What kind of place is that? It's a family-friendly restaurant, and they have 18 flat-screen TVs, a pass-through indoor-outdoor bar area, and a beautiful covered patio. Besides your Tuesday karaoke show, what kind of events do they have there? Wednesday is open mic and wine night. Is that when I can go and wine? No. It's when you can go and buy wine for 50% off. Uh, That's not just glasses. That's bottles as well. Thursdays is trivia. Night, 7 to 9. What about happy hour specials? Happy hour is Monday through Friday, 4 to 7. I'm assuming they have really delicious foods and maybe some food specials? They do have food specials. Actually, 11 specials for lunch that are six ninety five, and that's 11 to 3. Saturday and Sunday, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., they have breakfast. I'm assuming they have a website where you can go and uh, find out more information and, uh, and hours in their calendar. Absolutely. They have a website that includes their specials, their calendar, upcoming entertainment, everything. You can tell them the website, or you want me to? You I, tell I was the website. I was looking it up. It's seabreezebarandgrill.com. And what I discovered, and you're leaving out the most important part, is all the beers. You know, they have 46 beers there, I noticed, from their website. Yes. Including uh, 20 on draft and a lot of craft beers that are really exciting and trendy. They have Inland Monk in the trunk and Dirty Bastard in the bottom. They do. Among others, they have several sweet water. They have funky Buddha beers. They have a lot of beers there. So for those craft beer lovers out there. They're a full liquor bar. So whether you drink beer, wine, or liquor, they've got... You covered. They're at 4995 Southwest 148th Avenue in Davie. I'll be seeing you on Tuesday for your karaoke show. What time does that start again? Karaoke is 6.30 to 9.30 every Tuesday. At the Seabreeze Bar and Grill, 4995 Southwest 148th Avenue in Davie. 
put a team of professional consultants behind your home or business computer with key information solutions, providing solutions to your internet and computing needs while keeping you on the cutting edge of technology, preventative maintenance and networking support, hardware and custom built computers. Let key information solutions be your personal tech staff for your home or office with affordable hourly, monthly or annual rates to fit anyone's budget. Call Key Information Solutions now. 954-973-3374. That's 954-973-3374. Or visit keyinformation.com. We have such sites to show you. Soflowradio.com. You don't hear me. All right, we're back, and we did a little switching of the seats here. Hello. Jay Bird's Hello. up in the hot seat. Uh, Charles is over there, and I'd like uh, for everybody to uh, put their hands above the table from now on, okay, for the rest of the show, so it doesn't look weird or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my thanks, fault, right? Thanks, Char. I appreciate that. Uh, good suggestion there. And by the way, while we're saying hello to everybody... Say hello to your moms or whatever, everybody. Mom, I'd like to say hey, hello mom. to my wife, Caroline, who's in Ireland right now. Nice. Come back. I'll say hey Very to uh, fast, honey. my brother, Adam. I was on the phone with him uh, on the way down here. He's in Dallas. So, okay. Hey, Adam. What's going on? He's actually the one who started Corpse Nation with me. Great, great. Nice. Corpse Nation. Let's talk a little bit about that, Jay. Sure. Well, let me talk a little bit about Jay first here. Uh, uh, Charles, you were mentioning that, uh, you know, it really takes... Uh, a lot of really talented people, no doubt. A collaboration of a lot of talented people, and since uh, Jay and I met, we've been working on well, mostly this one project. But I'll tell you, he's invaluable for a lot of the things that we've done for uh, the the uh, the photography, uh, the special effects that we have for our show, um, and uh, also the videography as well. So you have a good eye for that. Uh, how long have you been involved, uh, interested in photography, Jay? Oh, photography probably since probably high school, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I've done much like some of our other guests here, Charles. Uh, I've been into film my whole life, mm -hmm. and I actually studied and went to school for meteorology. Uh, and and you pursued music and and composition and whatnot. And uh, I went to school for meteorology, but the whole time I've been writing and I've been uh, filming and, and doing photography. Mm -hmm. I was a professional storm chaser, and I still do that to this day. Wow. So always had a camera in my hand, and you now guys should I, talk. Sounds I'm, like you have the same type of uh, awesome personality, now, like thrill seeking. Yeah, three oh, yeah. thrill seekers. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And now uh, it's the same thing, but with a paycheck. So that's great. All right. Hey, uh, you know, speaking of photography, uh, George, I know uh, that uh, Jay is uh, taking some really cool pictures of some of our characters of Theater of the Vampires. Uh, we could throw some of those. There's Dracula. Uh, I know we collaborated a lot on these uh, some of these shots here. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the thing is, once you uh, you get a good subject and uh, interesting background and costuming, it, it's, you know, it kind of comes together pretty quickly. Uh, it, it does. I mean, a, a lot of people credit me for the photos and the pictures and whatnot. And, and you know, I, I don't take any of the credit. I say, you know, lights are lights and so on and so forth. And I understand that there's certain placement for them, but the actors still have to create the character. They have to become the character. They have to show emotion mm -hmm. and, and think their lines in their head and what they have to do on stage. And that really creates the moment. And mm -hmm. everything else is, in, in my opinion, uh, almost uh, just in ancillary. You know, it's a compliment to what they're creating in front of the camera. Sure. And then, you know, with a little technical knowledge, you just click, click away and uh, you get some really great photos. Yeah, there are some really great photos there, and and uh, and you got some behind the scenes during our practice there, which uh, that's always gives a lot of things away too, like when to snap it, when when to take that picture, when there's a certain you know moment going on there that is kind of explains you know what's going on in the scene. Yeah, when you're working with uh, professionals like we are here, uh, you can see in the in the rehearsals how much effort that they're putting in. You know, they they, mm -hmm. they don't you know, uh, take anything down a notch just because it's rehearsal. They give 100%, mm. and that's what really brings it out during the uh, the actual production. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and so far, just like it was back in October, there's uh, an incredible response. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you also have another project that, uh, like a photography project that you were working on uh, in the Everglades or something going on with that? Uh... Um, yeah, well, I've not necessarily a photography project, but... Um, a creative endeavor altogether. I work with the Everglades Wildlife Alliance, 
and uh, we're out in the Everglades um, dealing with the python invasion, Burmese pythons, rock pythons, and and, and essentially uh, all stories involving the Everglades, the wildlife, the uh, problems with big sugar and, and, the, and the issues that they create and uh, want to create awareness for a lot of these problems and try to come up with solutions because yeah. uh, a lot of people just aren't aware. They live down here, they, they know about the Everglades, but they don't really know what's going on out there, all of the endangered species and, and everything else. So I'm a part yeah. of the creative process of that and putting Correct. that in front of people. Yeah, it's funny. I've been down here since like 1967 hey. and the Everglades has kind of shrunk a bit since then. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I live think, what used to be in the Everglades. Yeah, exactly. You know, Cooper City. Yep. Used to be the Everglades and Weston, all that, oh, yeah. all those things. Totally. And that's another thing that people don't realize is that a lot of people, when they think of the Everglades off the top of their head, they think, well, South Florida. But it goes all the way up to Orlando. Orlando, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, yes, mm-hmm. it has shrunk over time, but it's huge. And different areas of the Everglades look completely different. You have those fields, the river of grass, and then you have tall, huge trees. And uh, it's one of the problems with the pythons is they wrap around the base of the tree uh, at like the Malaluka trees, which is an invasive species down here. Mm-hmm. We can't touch them because their sap actually burns your skin. So wow. you can't get too close to the trees. They wrap around the, the base of the trees. They're practically invisible. It's uh, you know problems that people don't realize that we actually have, but mm. and they have no solutions for it. Well, wow. that must be a tough shoot, though. I mean, when you're shooting out there in the, in the Everglades, I mean. it's it's brutal, especially in the summertime. <laughs> oh, uh, mosquitoes. Are Wait, the Everglades the worst. in the summertime? Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Can you imagine the uh, the uh, Seminole Indians or the, the Indians that used to live <laughs> out there. Mm. Yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't handle it. Yeah. It's just stuff being out there for a few hours um, around sunset in in August. I mean, if you've never done it, don't do it. <laughs> okay. Know, do good do, advice. Do, do your airboat rides in the morning. Do it in the afternoon. It's better to do it in the heat of the sun. Uh, don't do it at six p.m. Mistake. What, when I, maybe I'm missing something. What is it? Uh, honestly, it's the mosquitoes. Ah. Um, I mean, yeah, they're uh, brutal. W- w- words can't describe what what it's like. If, if you swatted like that, you'd hit five hundred of them. Wow. I mean, it, it's it's bad. Uh, I mean, I have uh, an airboat captain that I go out with all the time. His name's Captain Randy, and he owns, uh, I'll give him a quick plug, uh, ridethewind.com. And he is an encyclopedia of knowledge when it comes to everything in the Everglades, you know, and he even lets you drive the airboat and everything. He, I mm. mean, the, guy, the guy's amazing uh, and definitely my go-to guy when, when I'm out there. And um, I've been out there in the wintertime uh, in pristine conditions, and I've been out there in the summertime in the heat of the day, and we've been out there in, in difficult times in the dusk of the day and if you have a choice mm. uh you know choose uh not to be out there at sunset wow. at, at least not in the summertime in, in, in the winter time absolutely it's gorgeous i'll keep that in mind next time i'm driving down card sound road and uh my car wants to break down that's that to me is like forget about it uh mm. you know break down in card sound road wait till the next day get <laughs> rescued <laughs> 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 barricade yourself yeah Hope so uh works. You also are a, a special, you are into special effects in a big way. Isn't mm-hmm. that correct, sir? Uh, that is correct with uh, Theater of Vampires. And one of the things that makes this play unique is that it's transmedia, which I know you, you've spoken with uh, many times on your radio show and, and to and at networking events that I've, I've gone to with you. Uh, for those who aren't aware, but uh, when you have a transmedia production, you not only have your actors on the stage, but they interact with the audience and the crowd. They may come up into the audience. You have, uh, we've got a, a theater screen at the theater, like a movie theater screen. We mm-hmm. have stadium seating. So you've got video playing um, before the actors at the stage, during while the actors are on the stage. The mm-hmm. actors interact with the video. Mm-hmm. There are visual and special effects. And then there are uh, special effects live on stage, you know, mm-hmm. with, with lasers and smoke and lights and it's all encompassing and it's all immersive, all, all immersive. And music, don't forget that. That's oh, a big part of our uh, thing. Plenty of music, um, yeah. and and that runs the gamut from, uh, you like almost medieval sort of uh, archaic music to Lady you know, full, Gaga, full, full on full on rock and roll <laughs> and Lady Gaga. Yeah, right. Yes. So I'm glad you're a part of it, though. Uh, it's it was amazing. Uh, we we're talking about the serendipitous nature of the universe there, but. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we were putting this thing together in October, my friend Ricardo Bocanegra of the Black Bats. And it was almost like a last minute thing where, hey, uh, 
you know, a friend of ours mentioned that uh, this guy Jay and showed me some pictures of the corpse uh, nation, your your work that you do with uh, your corpse nation. Correct. Uh, I don't know if you have any of those pictures, but uh, some of the pictures of uh, the corpses and skulls and things like that. I go, wow, wouldn't it be awesome if we could get a like a corpse and like put them in like one of the seats while we're having Are these our play? Real corpses. <laughs> Yeah, well, they certainly look like it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, describe I, your method on I, that. There. I get that a lot, and that's the ultimate compliment, actually. Uh, <laughs> the, the short answer: No, they're not real corpses. Um, I actually buy the uh, skeletons or the skulls that I use, and usually they're uh, plastic resin or bone resin, and I age the bones, and then I add muscle tissue, uh, tendons, ligaments, and then flesh, and then I rot that. So mm. it looks like a realistic rotting corpse, and, if, that, and that's the whole. If purpose it smelled, it. the police would be there. Oh man! Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, wow. But and that actually came about. Uh, I mentioned my brother Adam earlier. Uh, he had a house down here, and he's like, "Jay, can you do a zombie for the front yard?" And I've done special effects where you know, if, I, if you wanted to look like a zombie for Halloween, I could do you know latex and things like that on you. But I've never tried doing something like that. So I said, "I don't know." And uh, I attempted it, and then everybody in the neighborhood, and but, well, actually, before I attempted it, we went to all the party stores, uh, just looking to buy stuff. But everything is geared towards kids, mm-hmm. and we're like, "Where's the cool stuff? Where's the stuff for adults <laughs> that want to celebrate Halloween?" And it didn't exist anywhere. So by the way, that stuff is cool to kids too, by the way. Oh, I mean, they do yeah. really like. Oh, there's a skeleton, mommy. They yeah, like they're that. actually not really yeah. afraid of it. They'll go up and they want to get pictures <laughs> taken of it and everything. So. Uh, so I realized that I had to create something from scratch, and I didn't know how to do it, and I researched, and I figured things out. And uh, I created something, and everybody in the neighborhood who came by said, oh, my God, where'd you get this? Where can I buy one? And, and you couldn't. And my brother and I had a conversation. We thought, well, how much is it going to cost to start a business? Is it going to be you know this much, or is it going to be a smaller amount? And we crunched the numbers, and we thought we could do it for a, a smaller dollar amount, and that's how Corpse Nation was born. Hmm. So, so Corpse Nation provides corpses for? Uh, corpses, skulls, bones for uh, feature films, oh, okay. music videos, uh, training videos for, you know, uh, DUI or something like that. Um, I mean, I mean, you name it. As a matter of fact, uh, yeah. the interesting thing is, and, and thank you for asking, it's actually an important question. The interesting thing is the majority of our customers are just people who want a unique horror collectible. Wow. If you're into horror movies wow. and, and, and you, and you would get a, a Jason mask or a Freddy Krueger glove, that's the sort of person that wants uh, something from Corpse Nation and something that they can show off with their other horror collectibles and have something unique because I don't use any machinery when I create them. Everything is done by hand. Yes. So every piece looks different. And Very he has cool. a real attention to detail. As a matter of fact, uh, Jay was telling me a story about how he was going to do one of these zombie walks. So I was like, well, how, what do I do to get my to look like a zombie, right? So uh, tell us what you did with the clothing there. Uh, um, well, it, like you said, I'm a, I have a keen eye for detail. So I, I don't like taking any shortcuts with anything. So I went to a thrift store. I bought a three-piece suit. You got the shirt. And I got the everything. And I buried it in the backyard. For, <laughs> nice. For, for three months. Three months. Oh, I see. <laughs> and, uh, Only three months. When I, now, when you talk about smell, this thing oh, obviously no. smelled. But it looked mm, completely like worms realistic. Worms in the pocket. Oh, mm. it, worms, bugs, oh, everything. I had to shake it out, and then I hung it up for about three days. Oh, and after the three days, it took care of the, the so smell So you didn't much. wash it? No. No. No, no. no that, that would defeat that the purpose. That would defeat the purpose, mm. yes. Yeah, if you want to really list, realistically look like a zombie, I can make that happen. <laughs> and uh, how, how, real, how, how real do you want to make it? But uh, it was very effective. So um, how did your girlfriend feel? Oh, that's right. You don't have a girlfriend. Uh, oh, sorry, Jay. <laughs> Burn. <laughs> oh, yeah. That wouldn't be very nice. You know. I'm married to my work right now. <laughs> there it is. Married to my Aren't corpses. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that's got to be something. So where do you keep that? Oh, in the yard, I guess, right? Uh, the suit? Yeah. I, I wear it on special occasions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> When he's going out to pick up girls, of course. Maybe there's a, yeah, I know yeah. there's a special occasion coming up this Friday, Friday the 13th. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's uh, another Theater of Vampires thing. You guys got to come to that one, okay? He's going to be wearing his suit, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, well, I, yeah, I guess now, <laughs> I, now I have to. You won't see him, though, because he's in the back doing special effects, but, you know. Uh, that's yeah, just that's the way true. I, I have a little hiding hole back there. 
Yeah. No, I do that, and and I know we've got the music coming up, and I want to mention this really quickly uh, because Theater of Vampires is done at the uh, the Abyss Stage the Studio over in Wilton Manors. Right. And after the Theater of Vampires run this month, next month we're going to be doing uh, something called Fifty Shades of Poe. Mm-hmm. We have uh, multiple directors doing uh, short stories. Short post stories, uh, their own renditions of it on stage. I'm one of the uh, writers and directors of that show, mm-hmm. so I'll be uh, doing one of the post stories and my own little reincarnation of it, and that should be a lot of fun. It's definitely yeah. something unique and different, something you haven't experienced before. All so, right, uh, so come to the Abyss Theater. That. There, a lot of good stuff going on there. Yeah. All right, folks, that's the, my show, and I appreciate you guys coming. Uh, all right. Uh, Ali Dolan, Charles Dye, and my friend Jay Bird. Uh, this uh, week on Rick's show on the radio. We'll see you next week on SoulFlowRadio.com. Later. Thanks, Rick. From high atop 1926 Hollywood Boulevard, you're listening to SoFloRadio.com.